this phone, please leave a message. At the tone, please record your message. Hey, Seth, it's Betsy. I was just leaving yoga and I'm calling to report a fresh deer kill. Like blood on the road. Everything that you probably want. It's just out of Winthrop, headed towards Nevada. Hope you get it. Oh, the legs are on still. Oh. All right. Oh, yeah. That'll do it. That'll work. Start to butcher. Yeah, can we do like a cut here and then another cut there and we'll keep the neck as a... Okay. Oh, yeah. Did you hear it? No, no. No. This is uh. Is it fresh. warm? No. 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 Truthfully, nice. if I was salvaging, I would not eat this deer because the hair came out. Okay. okay. My rule of thumb on salvage, having done several, yeah, is if it's still warm, yep, you're yeah. good. Are you a hunter? No. No. This is for the Wolverine project, so we're oh. just make, taking bait. So oh, but then, oh, that. for this is for the wolf, the wolfies, then you're fine. You yeah. have to look at our website. I will. What's images. it called? Yeah. Cascades Wolverine Project, all uh, one word, dot org. It's a sticker. It's a sticker. That's really. going on my guitar case. Yes. So we're in the North Cascades in a very special community. There's a lot of conservation-minded people in the Met How. Actually, I don't know that I want to tell people about the Met How. <laughs> Maybe it's a shit place. The Cascades are not high peaks, but there's a lot of vertical relief. They're very rugged. And when the snow falls, it's very good wolverine habitat. Um, keys we don't need, but I've right. got them. DSLR batteries, I've got flash batteries, I've got. We're good. Awesome. We're gonna skin up Valley and uh, check our station, see who visited, and then uh, hopefully celebrate. The odds that there's been a carnivore to our station, I'd say, are exceptionally high. Ooh. The chances that it was a wolverine are pretty dang good. Try not to get too excited. It's a very good spot. This is an effort to support wolverine recovery in the North Cascades. We are skiers and guides and have training in science, and so we're putting those skills together to shed light on what's happening with wolverines so that people are inspired to support this kind of work. Trail cameras look good. Conservation and research of an animal that has fallen through the cracks. Uh, this one got tree bombed. You ready to take a look at this thing, Steph? Oh, that's oh, when they came back I'm to sorry. check it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Oh, that's city? our. Oh! What the f? Nothing. Nothing! <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's so sad. sad. So for two weeks, we got nothing. That sucks. So I think our hopes are a little too high. Uh, we didn't get any triggers of any sort at all. Everything looks like it's working fine. So we just gotta be patient. Cool, thanks. Yeah. It's really frustrating, but <laughs> it's all good. This project, Cascades Wolverine Project, we boost Wolverine monitoring and we use photography to create these engaging images of wildlife. We're setting out remote camera trapping stations. We're using roadkill because that's our local organic <laughs> wolverine bait. <laughs> and then we apply a trapper's lure to draw animals into the stations and have their picture taken. That's our outreach. We're capturing images that inspire people to care about the animals. The population estimate in our area is 30 to 40 individuals. So to get one wolverine detection 
in a season, that's success. I almost don't even want to look. <laughs> First hit is a squirrel. Martin. Martin. Squirrel, bird, bird, snowshoe hare. Lovely, Martin. Beautiful. Somebody's dog. dog. Ooh. Coyote. Nice. Oh. Uh, bummer. We didn't get any detections in this last round, so yeah, we're just doing our thing, waiting on the wolverine. And this is what we do all the time. It's like we put all this work in trying to get pictures, and it's like it's really up to whether or not the talent shows up. We have very few animals and a very challenging landscape, so we've really decreased our chances of success, but this is the story we want to tell. It's normal, you know? You're still out in the mountains and, you know, skiing and observing the natural world. <laughs> it's a ton of work, but yeah, totally worthwhile. I think, I think it's all worthwhile. The storytelling part of our project is really important. To bring back images of wolverines, but other wildlife that survives in the mountains during winter. And get people excited, you know, about animals in general and their conservation and it's really effective. Has anyone ever heard of a wolverine? Second grade presentations are kind of chaotic. And they just love animals. So wolverines live not right here down in the valley, but they live up in the mountains. They're really tough to see. It's been nicknamed skunk bear because it smells like a skunk looks like a bear and has the short temper of both. The wolverine. So a wolverine looks a little bit like a small bear. Uh, they have a bushy tail. They have large teeth, big feet. Wintertime is their heyday. All the places where you'll find wolverines have long, cold winters and snowpack that lasts into the spring. It's the ultimate scavenger, surviving on the fringes of the food web. They eat whatever they can find. They're carnivores, they eat meat. Wolverines have tremendously strong jaw muscles that are just made for breaking bones. They're basically designed to find and consume meat across a landscape that's pretty destitute of resources. They seem to have a need to be moving all the time. They're always traveling. A wolverine's home range is really rugged. Gullies and ridgelines and peaks. They will move straight up steep couars or ice and rock faces, literally climb these lines up mountains and then run down the backsides. They're athletes, essentially. I mean, they're really extraordinary. I would say wolverines are one of the least understood carnivores in North America. So I'm going to Pass this around. <laughs> Having images of wolverines in their natural environment is like a glimpse into their lives. As soon as they see an image, I think there's a real natural connection and hopefully a desire to support their recovery. This unique species has endured because it can live and travel easily where few men care to follow in remote and rugged wolverine country. There's a few different reasons why wolverine conservation matters. We're going through a mass extinction. Any animal that you can connect with and support through conservation or citizen science or research is valuable, especially right now. And when you zoom down, to the local scale, it matters because they're just a cool animal. <laughs> they're just, why wouldn't, they're just inherently valuable. 
Wolverines are known to be very fierce and intrepid individually, but as a population, uh, they're vulnerable. Early 1900s, around the 1930s, we believe that we locally exterminated wolverines. The wolverine once ranged as far south as Pennsylvania. Traps, poisons, and habitat loss nearly wiped it out. Today, it's rarely sighted below the Canadian border. Like many wild animals, and specifically many carnivores, wolverines suffered tremendously at the hands of settler colonialism in North America. Part of that was fur trapping, so they were either killed for their fur or they were killed because they would raid the traps of fur trappers for the animals that were already caught there. During World War I, the federal government was really pushing for sheep production. Sheep make wool. Our soldiers on the European front needed wool uniforms to survive winters. So there was a big push to grow more wool. So there were tens of thousands of sheep in the Western Mountains, in the Washington Mountains, right here in the North Cascades. There were numerous bands of tens of thousands of sheep. Any carnivore can kill a sheep. And so to protect those sheep, their herders would shoot predators on sight. They would trap around their sheep herds as they moved through the mountains. But worse, I think, for wolverines is the fact that they would put poison out. So when a sheep died, they would lace that carcass with poison. And so anything that would come in and feed on it later would, would die. And I think with wolverines primarily being scavengers, that's what did them in in the Washington Cascades. Over several decades, wolverines started appearing again. But they haven't fully inhabited their former range. So we're witnessing wolverines recovering on their own, but it's pretty slow. They just don't give birth successfully all that often. And so it's really hard for an animal like this to recover after being targeted. There's Karen. Are you really taping that? Yep. There's me. <laughs> I grew up skiing on a reclaimed garbage dump near Detroit, Michigan. I got you, Steffi. <laughs> when that's your standard, like everything else is really mind blowing. <laughs> so. When I was in high school, a couple of different cousins invited me out west, and I just loved it. It was so thrilling, it was so beautiful. Absolutely, I was hooked. So someone's like, oh, you should work ski patrol. I was like, okay, I'll do that. Like, you should go to Alaska and work on a glacier. Okay, I mean, I was so impressionable and willing to do what it took to be in this environment. I started getting into guiding as a means to spend time in the mountains actually decided to go back to school for, for biology, for science. Partly because it's kind of hard to make a living guiding. <laughs> Partly because so many questions came up from being in those environments. Yeah, we met uh, outside of McCarthy, Alaska. I remember that you cut my hair. I don't remember that. Yeah, you, you uh, Gave me a, a bit of a mohawk, actually. Yeah, we got together pretty readily that summer, just as uh, you know, as, as partners in the mountains. And you could say we shacked up. We shacked up right away. Yeah. We don't have to include that in this. <laughs> Our focus was was being in the mountains, and particularly being in the wilderness. And it seemed like the the best way for us to get deep into places uh, that were high and wild and off the beaten path was with ski mountaineering trips. So that's, that's really what we embarked upon. We spent weeks and even months, you know, just all over the place in China and the Himalaya and Alaska and yeah. the Pacific Northwest. I don't think the wind slabs should be reactive anymore. They should be pretty stubborn. The perfect day skiing is with Drew. I think there's just this natural connection when you spend a lot of time 
in the winter in the mountains. It's really hard to explain. I think both of us are absorbed in the place, which is beautiful. You're just completely connected with the elements and with the place and with each other. Over so many extraordinary experiences in the mountains, like I feel like I've been filled. I think when you feel filled up by a habitat and environment, the mountains, whatever it is, you just naturally start to pour back out to help sustain that thing that gave you so much so that others can enjoy it, and others including animals. You know, through work guiding, I'm serving people, and through science, I'm serving an ecosystem. So there's a lot of satisfaction in being able to contribute to both of those things. It's a more whole experience. It seems, um, I, I get the sense you're, you don't crave the spotlight as a person. Um, no. <laughs> the hard part is just the public. It's a very vulnerable experience. And um, if I can just like focus on like getting the message across, that's w what matters. So this is Wolverine habitat. And this is also range that is going to be reduced over time. If there's something that you really value, then you have to be vocal, even if it's super un uncomfortable. <laughs> I can attest it might not ever get totally comfortable. Everyone has something to contribute, and each person's perspective is really important. As a photographer, I love camera trapping because a lot of photography of wildlife is like people set up a big long lens a long ways away. But with this, it's like studio photography for a super wild elusive animal. What are the failure points? Every part of it is a failure point. <laughs> if there's a mistake to be made, I will have made it. Oftentimes you get really close to a wonderful image, but not quite there because so many things need to line up. Way more often than not, we get nothing. It's a very energy intensive way to take pictures. To get into one of our most remote spots, we're driving for two hours to a ferry, we're taking a two hour ferry ride and skiing for an hour and a half from there. And then we have to come back a month later and do that all again to check the site. You know, I love working with Steph, we're a great team. She's an amazing, you know, ski guide and backcountry skier, and like I definitely depend on her to like make sure we're getting into and out of the mountains safely. But we just wouldn't be able to do this project without their skill set. Dave Moskowitz is um, one of a kind. Trail cam. We're very nice. close friends, and I think that part is essential for pulling something like this off. I think you have a little chocolate on your lip there. Where? Yeah, right there. He carries a stuffed animal with him occasionally, and I don't know if that's just to like, because it's sometimes it's stressful work, and he needs, How's it going? he needs his buddy with him. You don't have to share that part. <laughs> yeah, he needs a little bit more lightness in his life because he spends so much time uh, on complex issues. Our working experience together allows him to actually like have fun. <laughs> and just be in the mountains. We crossed Wolverine tracks. It's huge. And you can see the toes here. There's five toes. You can just barely make them out. Pretty incredible. You ready? No. OK. So we got about 2,000 photos in here. Off here. Hey! Oh, oh. <laughs> Wait, go back. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Come on in closer, buddy. Yeah. What's the date on it? Oh yeah. <laughs> that is a, oh. probably a different. We'll see. Wow. That's it. So we got one. That one. Oh, that that that. 
Yeah, most of the time we we don't get wolverine detections, <laughs> and we just had edge, one. Just so that's a huge score. And what's even better is we have a bit of hair. Yeah, so we put a hair snagging device on the tree, and then there's a really nice long piece of hair right here as well. So hopefully we'll be able to get a genetic sample out of that that'll tell us all about this wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> this is our first genetic sample in three years. Well, of the entire project, so it's our first. So, yay. <laughs> You know, the photographs are are stories. You know, each one of them is a story. Oh! And folks can really connect with those stories. Are you marking something? Yeah. You like that the flashes lighting up these animals are just creating these kind of spotlights on the wolverine and, and creating just an opportunity for people to see these animals in their native habitat. We'll get about one of those every season. Well, that's what makes it worth it, right? It's like you couldn't deal with the failure after failure after failure if the successes weren't really sweet. So that failure is actually kind of part of the story. Everything that David is doing is creating a lot more meaning uh, beyond the basic science. And we really need that for the Wolverine. The story of wolverine conservation is a really interesting one because there's a positive story here and a really dire future. We're seeing wolverines recover to places where they disappeared from, but at the same time, as we learn about these wolverines, we see that climate change is now becoming bigger a threat to them. Climate change is going to bring a warmer planet. And all predictions are that as the climate warms, wolverine habitat will become increasingly scarce and increasingly fragmented. The other thing is that wolverine occur in very low population size. In fact, in the lower 48 states, they think of only about 300 exist across that whole area. For an animal that has a low reproductive rate and lives in low densities, it doesn't take a lot of habitat loss to have a very serious decline in a population. You could just replace wolverine with skier, <laughs> and the ski season is shortening. Then you're bringing more people into smaller pieces of habitat that are also essential for wolverine to reproduce. So it's really important for us all to be on the same page here. Wolverines have been a candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And the reason that they were not originally listed was in part for a lack of information. Our project is really trying to shine some light into what's actually happening for wolverines to demonstrate they do need protection. So our camera traps are part of how we're documenting where wolverines are. And then our community science effort is also a part of that where we're asking backcountry skiers to send us photographs of tracks they found out in the field. We share all that information with our partners, which includes government agencies and nonprofits. We try to share with people who are in wolverine habitat that they have this really important role to play in submitting observations. State and federal resources for wildlife research are drying up. Citizen science efforts, such as the Cascade Wolverine Project, this is the kind of partnerships that are going to allow research to continue and they're going to become more and more important over time. The value of community science for a project like this cannot be overstated because most of the folks that can get safely and efficiently into places where wolverines live are not scientists. They're folks that are, they want to go out there and play in the mountains. And so to be able to tap into that resource is really awesome. It's pretty neat to feel like you can use a skill set like 
skiing and running around in the mountains in the winter to actually have a positive impact. That is a dream come true for me. It is surprising that so many people are fired up about this project. Wolverines, I don't know what else to say. They just kind of fire people up. <laughs> it's very special to share these stories with others and to think that that might have a positive impact. Ah, yes! <laughs> Wolverines are the spirit animal of the Alpine. They are an indicator that the mountain ecosystem is intact. And so if wolverines aren't in the Cascades, that's a signal that something's wrong. I hope that this project has a cascading effect on what people value, and that healthy mountain ecosystem is a priority, and that wolverines are valuable inherently. That would be the biggest success. Sheltering pines wait for me Far away from everything is where I wanna be Oh my heart is yearning Oh it is burning burning to be out among the sheltering pines 